Shuko, what do you think that is? I, I'm trying to figure out. It, I, it's maybe some Morse code? Uh, S, SOS? No, wait, that sounds slightly different. Um, maybe some kind of transmission, though. Mm-hmm, pretty good. It's the transmission, actually, of DCF-77. DCF-77 um, satellite space probe? It's a radio transmitter, actually, near Frankfurt, uh, here in Germany. Okay. Its signal is used to synchronize clocks and watches. Ah, okay, now I got it. Radio watches. Mine is synced over the internet, though, I'm pretty sure. Or the mobile network. Sure, yeah, the smartwatches have other ways of telling what time it is. But not every watch and every clock is connected. So if you live in Germany, your alarm clock or the clock at your train station might receive this exact radio signal. Okay, interesting. So the current time is encoded in this. Yes, the time is precisely measured by an atomic clock. And thanks to DCF-77, <laughs> watches and clocks can reach almost the same level of precision. Well, given the transmission delay and that some receivers are cheaply built, your alarm clock might be off by a tenth of a second <laughs> so that you can sleep longer. <sighs> yeah, I, although, you know, I, I, I don't want to discriminate against my nationality that I'm French, so we're known for being late. <laughs> um, and so um, anyways, those tenth of a second is definitely not good enough for an excuse when I'm running late. But um, I think you touched on two topics that we're covering today. Cheaply built watches and precision. And expensive watches and precision, oh, okay. too. <laughs> we'll be exploring technology that marries analog watches with the digital world to create their digital identity. And what that all means, we will find out. Let's do it. From know-how to wow. The Bosch Global Podcast. Fakes are everywhere these days. I mean, just look at what AI can generate. A new painting by a famous artist? Not a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same is true for other media. Voices, for example, can easily be cloned. A five-second sample of someone's voice can be enough to have an AI speak with that person's voice. Just write anything that you want the person to say and the AI will say it. And that's actually a really huge problem. So not just for politicians or, you know, celebrities whose voices are cloned um, without their consent to create so-called deep fakes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also a problem for you and me and everyone literally out there. Scammers are cloning people's voices and then using those voices to call the person's parents or grandparents, for instance. So if I were a bad person, I could use this podcast to clone your voice, Milena, mm -hmm. and then I could use that exact voice, to call your family, tell them lies using your voice, that you're in some sort of emergency situation and that you need a huge amount of money quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very scary, really. Um, fortunately, that hasn't happened to me, but I definitely heard of it, um, even from, from close friends and family. So it's not completely hypothetical. These things are really happening. My advice, everyone should share a safe word with their family members, um, something really only your family knows. That's really good advice and should work to disarm a scammer on the phone. Some fakes, however, are really difficult to detect and expose. And this time I'm not talking about digital fakes, but actual physical ones. Right. Fake products, as you mentioned before, are everywhere too. Uh, luxury handbags, for example, mm -hmm. um, airplane parts, earbuds, mm -hmm. everything is being copied and sold as a real thing. Can you imagine even wine? The blasphemy, even wine. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Police have busted criminals producing and selling uh, fake Bordeaux wine, actually. And <laughs> there were even some claims that more alleged Bordeaux is consumed in China than is produced in France. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll let you do the math. Oh, I, I wish that I could tell a real Bordeaux apart from a <laughs> fake one. <laughs> Poor Roulette. I mean, I do like to drink like a grass of wine here and there, but <laughs> I think I couldn't tell a real Bordeaux apart from a fake one. <laughs> and there are many other things where it's getting more and more difficult to determine what's fake and what's not. Watches, for instance. Another example. The super clones of watches are getting better and better. 
super clones <laughs> are what Louis Tepper calls almost perfect copies of expensive watches. He says even experienced watchmakers might need 15 minutes to figure out if a watch is a super clone or an authentic product. 15 minutes, that's actually a really long time. And that's an expert examining the watch. So how are, I would say, normal people supposed to tell the difference between them then? Hmm. Um, or say, you know, customs officers, they're tasked with finding these fake products. How would they know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really becoming almost impossible. But Lewis has a solution. You see, watches are important to Lewis, but more on that later. We're talking to him in the first place because he is a software developer at Bosch and has been working on a brand new technology called Origify. And with our technology, they can just press the button or using the smartphone application and checking within three to five seconds. Okay, I know now it's a fake one or a real one. Wait, <laughs> let's take a step back. This sounds like, uh, first of all, a really smart solution, but we're not at the end of the episode just yet. <laughs> so can we, can we maybe start at the beginning, Melina? <laughs> right, that makes sense. <laughs> So, the story of Rentify begins in a Bosch plant that produces automotive parts. In 2018, our project manager had the task of ensuring the traceability of a single part for the sensing element in the exhaust system. To be precise, these sensing elements were lambda sensors, and we've mentioned them on the show a couple of times before. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have. <laughs> they measure the amount of oxygen in a combustion engine vehicle's exhaust, which allows drawing conclusions about the combustion in the engine. Bosch innovation from the 60s, still going strong. The sensing elements, they are produced in the facility in Bamberg and also at Feuerbach, and they are producing millions of parts each year and it's still ongoing. And as Lewis said, a few years back, we wanted to start tracing these millions of parts over their lifetime. Of course, because quality is so important in the automotive industry. So if a part fails, you want to be able to trace it back to its origin and figure out what happened. So why don't we just engrave a serial number on the sensor? Sounds easy enough, doesn't it? If you engrave something on the sensing element, then the function is not longer guaranteed. So that was a no-go for this. A no-go, Milena. <laughs> okay, I came up with a no-go idea. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, next idea, we print something on the sensor. Maybe not a serial number, but a QR code. <laughs> the problem was that the sensor was too small to mark it with a QR code or a DMC code. Everybody knows QR codes mm. and DMC codes are very similar. So black and white pixels in a square. Mm -hmm, right. But apparently no room for those on the tiny sensors. Guess that's why I'm not a Bosch engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Both of my ideas, a no-go. <laughs> but then the Bosch engineers were like, what if we don't scan QR codes or DMC codes printed on the surface of the sensor? But instead, we simply scan the surface of the sensor itself. So we can recognize the sensor by its surface structure. So we're not talking about face recognition, but surface recognition, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> kind of like face recognition for sensors. So from the first tests, the results were a recognition rate of 99.8%. So really good. Wow. It worked pretty well from the get-go, and it needed only a very small amount of surface to work with. The solution was to just take an image of a small area, only 5 square millimeter. So let me pull out my calculator here. Square root of 5 is 2.24. So 2.24 millimeters times 2.24 millimeters is enough for the surface recognition technology. That's insane. Mm -hmm. Just this tiny spot is unique for each of the millions of sensors produced every year. And so when you at a later time need to identify one of those millions of items, it's quick and easy. When this sensing element comes back because there was a failure, maybe, you can just make an image again. And you see, okay, it's this part produced on this date with the serial number in this batch. 
and you can say, okay, that's why there was a problem or there was a failure. So in a way, they identify the item just by closely looking at it. Yep, that's right. And that's where this technology can work with almost anything. Origify works with surfaces from metal to wood, from plastics to paper, from paint to leather. There are not a lot of materials that do not work. For example, t-shirts, fabric, because it's too elastic. And also glass itself. So we cannot do images of glass itself. But images through glass is no problem. So that means any kind of product that is made out of the materials that you listed will work well, as long as it's not elastic or transparent. Mm, or too shiny. If something produces a lot of reflections, it's hard to take a usable picture of the surface. But you're right, yeah, that opens opportunities for Origify to be used on a vast range of products. You can use it everywhere for museums, for auctions, for example for the high security printing industry, like banknotes, like official documents. Um, the luxury industry, I would say, has the biggest counterfeit problem. That's why we are focusing on watches, on leather goods, also on jewelry and also on sunglasses or glasses itself. And also for the industry, like spark plugs, like sensing elements, you can use it everywhere. Out of those, Louis personally has one favorite area of application. I mentioned it, watches, <laughs> and in particular, vintage watches. Wearing so much craftsmanship and mechanical technology on your wrists, I think it's simply fascinating to me. So Louis collects watches, buys and sells them. And that's why he's personally worried about those super clones of watches that he mentioned in the beginning. As a ends consumer, I have no chance to check if the product I want to buy is a real one or a fake one. I have a similar issue when it comes to bags. Is it bags? <laughs> so for me, it's bags. Same here. <laughs> um, and so, so it, you know, it is quite shocking. You spend hundreds and maybe even thousands of euros <laughs> or dollars or whatever currency you're using on fancy mm -hmm. products, watches, you name it. But you can't be sure if it's the real thing or not. So how does he navigate this? You said he's still buying and selling watches? I go to my trusted jeweler, to be honest, <laughs> where I mostly bought my watches and where I think I can trust him. Which means when he's on vacation, for example, and he sees an interesting piece in a shop window, it's very unlikely to buy it because all he has to rely on is trust. Same with selling some of his watches. Sometimes I'm selling them to friends, so that's a really trusting environment because I do not want to lose a friend. That's why I do not want to sell them a fake one. <laughs> But sometimes I also sell them via platforms and they buy the watch and they check the watch. And afterwards, after the checking, they sell them to the customer. And I mean, that customer has to trust the platform that they thoroughly checked if the watch is real or fake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Milena, I think this is a good time for me to tell you that I researched a little bit for the episode, as I usually Ooh, do. do. <laughs> Because um, I as well learned something about how much the watch industry relies on trust. It's getting very hard to figure out what is what. And the only way you really know is if you are buying it from a trusted source. This is Rune Backendorf, and he's not talking about watches right now, but about spare parts for watches. He's a watchmaker in Copenhagen, and part of his job is repairing vintage watches. So getting authentic spare parts can be a huge challenge for him. It's also going down to how much money do you want to spend on finding out what it is. but. There are people that take material uh, samples from the parts or do an X-ray spectrometry test to see if the material is the same. An X-ray spectrometry on spare parts. That's wild. So there are not only fake watches, but also fake spare parts. Here's another thing that I learned from Rune. Watchmaking is not a dying craft. So there are a, quite a few young watchmakers, um, just like him, that really have a fascination for mechanical watches and clocks. 
Um, this is the show where we talk about smart technology. <laughs> Little reminder. <laughs> <laughs> smart watches. Oh, well, I guess analog technology can be very cool, too. This is a show where we usually talk to people who are passionate about something. Mm -hmm. So in this case, mm -hmm. we talk to geeks <laughs> and Rune is the biggest watch geek I have ever met. <laughs> oh, fair. <laughs> When you study the history of horology and watchmaking and clockmaking, you see that there is these almost 700 years now of innovations, both in technical terms and in design terms. And I feel like I want to add something to this long line, long heritage of horological work. And... If I can just set a, a little dot somewhere in that history, it would make uh, my life worth it. He has aspirations. I love that. You can really hear the passion and he's definitely got the right attitude. So Rune loves studying historic watches and he gets inspired by them and actually creates his own. Um, so he's built several small series of watches from complete scratch. And he sent us some recordings from his workshop working on his lathe. Ooh, all right, that sounds like some heavy duty, actually. You can see him shave some metal off of a part, uh, measure it, shave off some more, measure again. So he says he often works to a precision of one one hundredth of a millimeter. And for some parts, his work has to be even more precise, and the watches he produces are very unique. Here in Copenhagen, where I'm based, in the 1800s, we began to be more and more our own thing. You could see that they had these idiosyncrasies of design and construction that seemed to go more and more away from the standard of continental Europe at that time. And that is something you could call the Danish watchmaking DNA. Oh, I love how passionate he is. Very cool. But Rune says that unique Danish style of watchmaking got lost later on. So we're looking in the 20th century, when it became harder and harder to compete with watchmaking industries in France and Switzerland. So I've begun to go down the rabbit hole of seeking out as much Copenhagen watchmaking as I can do and immerse myself, getting inspired and thinking about how would how would it be used to this day? So I'm really trying to recreate this Copenhagen DNA and carve out something that feels authentic to me as a creative watchmaker, something that speaks my story and looks at the world from my viewpoint. Oh, really? That I find this so interesting because I have to admit that I've never heard of Danish or, or particularly Copenhagen watchmaking. I'm pretty sure even most watch collectors haven't, but here's a, an example of what that could look like. In my newest wristwatch, I did another way of indicating time, so you can still see seconds, hours and minutes, but it's not the usual hands that move. The hands are stationary and there are these revolving dials that move around and show the numbers at the end of the hands, which are stationary. And that was inspired by a mechanism from a turret clock here in Copenhagen. So there is also this historical relevance where I'm trying to echo this. So the, it, it really is a, a playground both of how can it look, how can it function, but most importantly is that it's high quality, top finishing and creating a very precious object that the customer, the collector, will want to cherish for a long time. It's built for a lifetime use. Do you know what Rune calls these artfully made watches? Oh, I can't wait. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the final thing I learned from him. Rune? Haute horlogerie watches. Haute horlogerie. Haute horlogerie is, is haute couture, but uh, it's high watchmaking. Oh, okay, I love that. Like haute couture. You got it. <laughs> so coming back to Origify, if I want to buy an haute horlogerie watch and make sure it's not a fake, how can Origify help? First of all, the watch would need to have been registered with Origify by the manufacturer. To do that, they can use a tabletop device that was created just for this purpose. It looks a bit like a coffee machine. The device contains a camera, a ring light and a custom fixture for the item so that it is perfectly aligned for the photo shoot. 
This device is a standalone device, so it can be integrated into the production line, depending on the application, but can also be placed, for example, at a visual inspection station, where every part passes anyway, and then you can do the first registration there. The industrial-grade computer inside the registration device then processes the image. And the pre-processed cropped image is then sent to the cloud, where the image is converted into a hash code that cannot be reverse engineered for security reasons. And we also do not store images, but only the codes. Okay, explain that part a little more. I know a hash code is like a cryptographic representation. Each input into the hash function produces a unique output. Mm -hmm, yes, but it doesn't work the other way around. So you can't use the hash code and then recreate the input, in this case, the image from it. And that's helpful, for instance, if a company produces watches and wants to register them with Origify before they announce the model publicly. They wouldn't want images to appear somewhere. Right, so the hash code doesn't tell you anything about the product it belongs to. Except when your input is an image of the same product again. Then you can see that this hash code is already in the database. Actually, I can show you this part. I ordered myself an Origify test kit, and it is pretty simple, actually. Okay, so what I have here are these white square cards. Mm -hmm. I'd say mm, three times three centimeters. And they look identical. I really have a bunch here. So they look identical, except that on the back of them, they have different serial numbers. Okay. I'm trying to show Shuko. <laughs> I can see clearly. <laughs> yeah, the laptop camera. <laughs> okay. So some of them um, have like the serial numbers printed on the back and some don't. And now I install the Origify app on my smartphone and I can scan these cards now. Pretty easy, actually. I can just click on verify here. Mm -hmm. And then the app tells me how to position the card. It says place the product on a flat, non-reflective surface. So done and done. I click on begin. All right, so the camera app on my smartphone opens together with a flashlight and a mask, pretty similar to scanning a QR code. So there's a mask that I have to align with the card on the table. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the app tells me to hold still. Okay, mm -hmm. picture taken. Then the analysis process starts. I guess that takes a while. Oh no, that went that went pretty quick, actually. Looks good. Mm -hmm. And now it says under authentication details that the result is authentic. And it gives me a custom ID. 5410. Let's check on the back. 5410. That's quite impressive because I for sure couldn't see a difference between all of the cards that you were showing. Yeah. Um, and they were identified so quickly. But what actually really surprises me most is that this is possible with a phone. That a smartphone camera can see enough detail in the surface of a five square millimeter spot for this to work. Yeah, there's really no special equipment necessary. I mean, no microscope, not even a special smartphone. It should work with any recent model, actually. So if someone like Lewis wants to buy a new watch, they just pull out their phone and know if it's real or not within seconds. If the manufacturer registered it with Origify. But what about those vintage watches that Lewis is mostly interested in? An old watch can't be registered, right? Well, Origify has only been on the market for like a year, but older products can still make it into the database. We can also do backwards enrollment, for example. So if there are already images existing of each product from 10 years ago, for example, and they are suitable, we can also just store them in our database. And then all the items that are produced 10 years ago are also available in the smartphone application. Right. And some companies might actually have those images taken during quality inspections. Mm -hmm. And there's even a second way how vintage products could become origified. <laughs> nice one. A lot of watch manufacturers currently are 
um, working on the pre-owned certified programs to certify their own vintage watches and sell them again. Okay, so if we take the example of Rune, we could be like, yes, I made these watches years ago. Uh, here's our stamp on it. Or even better, we invisibly register it with Origify and you can use your phone to check that. To wrap it up, I think it would be good to add another reminder that watches are just one example. Mm -hmm. And perhaps not the most important one even. Even our watch fan, Louis, agrees. We also did some POCs in the medical field. So for medical devices, for some drugs, for example, and for medicine. And um, that's more the way we also want to go in the future because that's really important for the people. So, okay, maybe you have a fake watch that's maybe not good, but if you buy a fake medicine, mm. then maybe it will cost your life. Mm. And we want to prevent this with our technology. It's truly invented for life. Indeed. Yeah, very, very impressive. Aushuku yet again. And as always, it's been a pleasure podcasting with you again. Likewise, Milena. Mm -hmm. We did some, let's say, odd uh, podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can call it oh some God, uh, no. odd divertissement or odd entertainment. <laughs> oh, and then there's you with your proper French. <laughs> uh, see you soon, guys. Talk to you soon. <laughs> exactly. So au revoir and listeners, the next episode is already in the making. Watch out for more insights about Orgify. From know-how to wow. The Bosch Global Podcast. I'm Jeff's voice avatar and I'll talk to you soon. Because the next deep dive episode is coming up. We'll have a closer look at how Origify works and what manufacturers and brands can get out of it in addition to fraud prevention.